trends. We just heard about future of mobility and also in the air. Obviously a great vision. Now let's put our feedback on the ground and hear about the deep transformation of an icon in the automotive industry, BMW, a global love brand for German engineering. Now I have the pleasure to welcome Oliver Zipse, Chairman of the Board of Management of BMW. Oliver, he's been at BMW for 30 years, for 30 years now, and he has held various responsibilities within the company in development, technical planning and production. Since 2019, Oliver is the CEO of BMW Group and in charge for more than, imagine, more than 120,000 employees worldwide. Oliver, the floor is yours for your opening sta um, statement. Well, hello everyone. As you all know, uh, we have a great transformation, as we just heard from Mark and, uh, and, and Tobias here. Uh, but before Steffi and I jump into our conversation, allow me to share some thoughts with you. Um, with the start of the new decade, all major world regions are now firmly committed to climate protection. As you all know, the United States have returned to the Paris Climate Agreement and China as well wants to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. And of course, as you all know, the European Union is driving forward the Green Deal. And like no other sector, mobility, individual mobility, is regarded as a role model for progress. This is simply because vehicles and their footprint are very visible in our everyday life. At BMW, we embrace sustainability. We strive to become one of these role models, not only with our products, but with our entire company. And we can only achieve this by leveraging our full technological competence. Of course, we are electrifying our fleet. But this is just the visible part of it. Our ambition is to build the greenest electric vehicles in our industry. From raw materials, the supply chain and production up to recycling. Just two examples for this. Our suppliers are using 100% green electricity and battery cell production already today. And our own production and all of our facilities worldwide are already today 100% CO2 neutral. And now we are already thinking beyond CO2. Did you know that every year more than 100 billion tons of new materials are entering the global economy? We need to find ways towards a more circular economy. For example, in our vehicles, we use up to 50% secondary aluminum in specific parts already today. But we're aiming much higher. We're initiating a paradigm change with a new approach in development. And we call that secondary first, wherever the level of material quality allows it. And this means we are re-evaluating every part of a vehicle. How can we maximize the use of secondary materials? Where can we use biomaterials or monomaterials for better recycling at the end of a car's life? And it's crucial to understand we need to act today because any impact needs time, especially in our industry. When we think of recycling a car that is in development today, we have to think 15 to 20 years ahead. At the IAA Mobility 2021 here in Munich, which will hopefully take place in Munich this year, we will show further proof of our circular approach. Thinking long term, from cradle to cradle, from the birth of one vehicle to the birth of the next one. On that note, let's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. This was amazing. Wasn't it a bold approach for a car company, isn't it? I wonder, I wonder what the 120,000 employees, how did they react to your vision of sustainable um, of a focus of sustainability, of circular economy, all these buzzwords of this amazing change in our society. And how, how is the culture of BMW 
aligning with this? You know, uh, as you said before, um, I'm 30 years with the company and BMW is thriving on change, is thriving on innovation. And some 10 years ago, we made a big first step towards sustainability. We invented the i3, which is still in the market today in its eighth years of its life cycle. And that was a big motivation for us to try something completely new. And what we do now, we transform that into the whole company. The i3 was, was one project, one car out of 50. And now we, we're transforming that into the whole company. And I feel that uh, the team is highly motivated to contribute. Yeah. I, I was at the factory in Dingolfing and I was so impressed about the seriosity and the devotion of your production colleagues. It really, it, if I would be 18, maybe I, I would start to be an in engineer because it, it's really, it's something. Who of you, dear audience, has recently visited a car company? You should. It's really interesting. It, it's, an, it's an amazing change what happens there. The production lines are completely different to then 10 years ago. Isn't it so? What is the difference? No, I think so too. Um, car car development, car production, R&D, and the whole supply chain is, is team sport. Team sport. You know, everyone has to work with someone else. And then if we uh, do produce a revolutionary product like the iX, which mm -hmm. you've seen in, in Dingolfing. And I want to a, drive it. Yes, of course. <laughs> and, and you will. I promise that to you. <laughs> okay. And, and you will. You know, it's, a, it's, it's fun to be part of a revolution. And car production is something highly innovative today. It, is not, it has nothing to do with the, the, with the image you might have from, from car production. It's dirty and, and strenuous and so on. It's, um, it's a lot of fun and, 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 and to contribute also uh, into a revolution which happens currently in Dingolfing and also at, our, um, uh, um, at, at the other plants in our production network. Because every single plant is being transformed into electromobility. So let, let's go back to your words before. You said we need to act today, but impact needs time. Isn't it already too late to think about sustainable cars now? What is needed to act fast and to be competitive at the same time on a global level? Not all countries around the world have the same standards as the European Union when it comes to envi environmental protection. So what's your take on this? Well, very seldomly it's too early and it's never too late. You know, you can, you can always start fresh. And the good thing in our industry, whenever you start with something, you then after five years develop or four years of development time, you will have the newest technological standards in the car. So you can, you can start any time. What we see with all the experience we have uh, through our um, electromobility cars it's now the right time to leverage all our competence, to thrive into higher volumes. We will have uh, in two and a half years time, 12 fully electric vehicles in the market. All our plans have been rebuilt to accomplish that. And I think we are right on time to drive up um, um, that electromobility, which is happening in Europe. This is the fastest growing electromobility market in the world, by the way, followed closely uh, by China and then the United States and the rest of the world. So I think this is in a highly exciting time. And the next step is to not only think about the CO2 fit footprint during the life cycle of the car, but also during um, the supply chain. Because with the shift from combustion engines to electric vehicles, the footprint shifts from the life cycle into the supply chain. And that's where we put our focus on as a next step now. Even the greenest vehicle, and you spoke about it, needs a proper infrastructure. For example, charging stations. If I see it correctly, Oliver, mm -hmm. yeah. there are not enough yet. What to do? Is it a collaboration between um, industry and politics? Or what is needed for it? What is the challenge? Um, you will be able to, to read an, uh, an opinion article uh, written by myself tomorrow in in one of the, the German um, economy newspapers. And I will state there that we need to achieve 37.5 or even 50% CO2 reduction in the automobile industry until 2030. We need 
more than 50 million charging stations in Europe. 50 million. And 50 million. And 15 that is or 15? 50. 50. Imagine, 5, 0. Imagine. 15, yeah, 50 million. The, the calculation is quite simple. First of all, you need uh, uh, private charging stations at home. You will need charging station at the, at the employer. And of course, the most discussed public charging stations. But the, 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 amount, the, the biggest amount of charging will happen at home. You know, and, and only about 10 to 15 percent in public charging stations. So what we are addressing that public charging stations, employee, um, employer parking, uh, uh, charging and also private charging must be, must be put up to a completely new level. The automotive industry in Europe is selling, depending, depending on the year, somewhere between 12 and 50 million cars per year, new cars per year. And we want to, to have about half of these vehicles being fully electric by 2030. So every year another seven or even eight million cars come already to the existing fleet and more and more of these cars will be electric. So we better start now to think the charging in um, infrastructure all the way to the end. Charging boxes, power, who is supplying this, what is the concurrent business model with it, who, who, is, who, who is investing, I think this is the next big step because the automotive industry, and I don't know any car producer which, which is not thriving on electric vehicles, there will be more than enough cars um, in the world. So the next big step is charging infrastructure now. Next big step. And um, if I see it correctly, what you just said, it's a big, big shift for not only your company, but for the German car industry at a whole. German car industry is always regarded as amazing engineer work, German quality engineering work. So if you would be 20 years old, in which part of your company would you expect future? Where would you go to learn and to work? <laughs> you know, the, the, the car industry is a big system integration industry. It integrates mechanical elements. In, in, it involves um, high-tech battery cells. It involves all forms of digitalization. You know, in, in all kinds maps and 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 connectivity. And our newest cars will have five G connectivity. So wherever you go into this industry, you will find innovation. You know, and the fun of it is it's a global industry. You can work, work in many parts of the world without ever leaving the company. And in its current state, at least I can talk for BMW, almost any department is driving on innovation to, to conquer this climate change uh, um, challenge we have all together. And we have uh, at most 30 years time. I don't think that we even have that much time. So we, we, we better get our uh, um, act together. And the answer to this change is not to disregard individual mobility, but to find the right technologies to offer to the world market of 80, 90 million cars per year, the right product to reduce our uh, carbon footprint. We just um, had Dennis Crowley talking about um, location-based services. And I make sure, Oliver, that I will introduce him to you because I think you have a lot to talk about it. I think location-based um, software is very much needed in cars, and I'm sure you do it. But not, we, we, I will introduce you to um, um, the Dennis, but now I want to speak about something different. Our next speaker will be Rem Kohlhaas. Rem Kohlhaas, this famous, amazing, very focused um, urbanist and architect. He is at the forefront of envisioning the future, not only of the cities, also of our urban country, of our countryside. But coming back to cities, what is your vision in the future of cities? Well, this is an extremely important question because we live here in Munich, which is a city which is uh, covered by many traffic jams. No, not right now because we have, we have a corona crisis, but under normal circumstance, you have a lot of traffic jams. That is not the future of a city I, I foresee. Um, you know, we looked very closely to Copenhagen for the last 10 years and we, we made research 
on the behavior of individual travelers. And we found out that individual travel by bikes increased from roughly 36% of all um, um, uh, kilometers traveled to, to 49%, the big increase of bicycles. At the same time, the ownership of cars increased. And what decreased is public transport. So if you look at the real life circumstance of many people, they like in the, in the inner circle of, of, of towns, uh, they, they, they don't use the car as much. And that's the inner circle of two or three kilometers. But everything outside is done by individual mobility. And that could be a scheme uh, for the future that I have an intelligent digitalized combination between individual mobility on bike and car supplemented through a very connected uh, public transport. Um, but I think to push more cars into already extremely dense cities is not the answer. It's a combination of different modes of individual, individual mobility. And especially in existing uh, towns and cities, we have a job to do. We are, we're just starting there. Yeah. Interesting. I, I just watched um, a discussion between Larry Fink from BlackRock and Masha Yoshi-san. And Larry asked Masha Yoshi-san, this Japanese investor, you know, SoftBank, this company, what he sees as the next big thing in the future, not only in the car companies, but what does he see as the big future thing? And guess what he said? I was astonished. He said, I see the future of, of cities and future of the next, in the next big thing will be autonomous cars. What is your take on this? Well, completely autonomous cars are already technologically possible today. We, we have them. You know, on our drive tracks, we have fully autonomous cars. The question is how quickly, first of all, can you make a business model out of it? Because currently completely autonomous car, we talk about level four or level five, are extremely expensive still. Of course, costs will decrease, so that's one hurdle we have to conquer. We have to get the cost down to make it affordable for, for many people. And the second thing is, is, of course, the safety of these cars. Absolutely nothing should happen while driving in a completely autonomous car. So in the cost side and at the same time, the safety side and the security side will bring us to slowly developing. We go, we talk about level two, level two plus, where the driver is still in control. Then we go to level three where you can hand over the technical control to the car. I think we will see a swift development all over the world over these steps. Some countries are faster, like uh, China and the United States. Some are a little bit more um, risk averse, like Europe, uh, for sometimes very good reasons. So we, we will move slowly towards driving assistance system, automated driving all the way to autonomous driving. I, and it will start not in the individual car traffic we see, we know today. It will much more be on individual lines, buses, people transport, um, transfer routes and so on. That is where we will see um, um, the cars. But it's a, it's, a great, it's a great thing. We are working hard on it to, to do it step by step. Uh, if you ask me when the whole world will be completely autonomous, we will have to wait and see, but uh, hopefully very soon. Okay, maybe this is now an odd question, but somehow I think I'm under the impression that this is the elephant in the room. How do you react on efforts like um, Tesla, like Elon Musk, to become the dominant leader in the world of cars, automotive mm. ideas? Yeah. I expected this question, of course, you know, there's always asked. Um, I'm I think, sorry for this no, banality, no, no, but it's, no, it's, fine. it's, it's part interesting, of, isn't it? No, this is part of our industry, you know, yeah. and, and, and he's rapidly grow, this company is rapidly growing, especially in the United States, in specific parts of the United States, not everywhere in the United States. He's uh, still rapidly growing in, in, uh, in China. He, he doesn't have this uh, blow away success in Europe. Maybe yet, um, but, but the last year was not, he, he didn't grow more than the rest of the industry. So we will have to see how, how the rest of the industry uh, develops in terms of electrical driving, in terms of 
um, of the whole system integration. We, we take more care of having the safest vehicle. And I'm not only talking about, about uh, BMW. So we will have to see how the rest of the industry will. It will, it will not be easy for Tesla to, to, to continue in that speed we have seen so far because the rest of the industry is moving quick, big time ahead. And so we will, we will have to see, but it's, it's a nice challenge, of course, you know, and, and uh, we embrace it, you know. It's fascinating um, listening to you because I think what you produce and what you do right now is kind of a ro being a role model for major companies to become future, future aware, future um, futurists. And Oliver, I thank you so much for this insight. And I hope we continue our discussions Late, latest at the EI International Automotive. Hope to see you then, yeah. We hope for um, aut um, automotive EAR. What is the Abkürzung? What is the EAR? Internationale Automobilausstellung. Okay, yeah. Internationale Automobilausstellung. It will be one of the biggest auto shows in the world it here will in be Munich. It a mobility show, by the way. Uh, yeah. uh, Not no, only cars. Not only cars, mobility shows. And um, DLD will take also, to, like, people. CEOs like Oliver to this and uh, not to, we don't take you to this but we will ask you there what's going on there and I'm very happy that we sat at my desk here in this green room it's, it's my it's by the way it's my desk my writing desk in my office very nice you it's good. yeah like very, it. yeah. very stable That's yeah very stable very old um, no, great perfect. perfect so the future and the old thing together. Thank you for this. Thank you very much, Steffi. Thank you. Thank you. Good. We have an audio question, I see. Would you like to, to answer it? Yes, of course, if we have time. Yes. Yeah. When do you switch to hydrogen engine and fuels? You know, at, at BMW, and I can only answer this for, for my company, um, we, we think of something we call uh, a multitude of drivetrains, you know, you might call that power of choice or whatever. In specific parts of this world, especially in the eastern part of Asia, namely Japan, but also Korea, um, you, they've already started to build up a big hydrogen infrastructure. And BMW is a global company and, and we respond to specific market conditions. And our flexible architectures allow to do that. So we will, we will participate in growing markets um, independent of the actual local um, drivetrain um, uh, taste of our customers. Um, I think hydrogen will start moving along which, which bigger scales after 2025. We will have our first test fleet next year, 2022, with an X5 in the market. So we will. We will, just like we've done 12 years ago with electromobility, we will test our customers. But there will be a place for, for uh, the fuel cell, which at the end of the day is an electric vehicle. So I, I, see, I see a role of hydrogen in our industry. Good, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Steffi. Well done. It was fun. Thank yeah, you. it was fun. Thank yeah. you. Good. So, my friends, there's a cut now, or should I moderate the next thing? Please give me an, this is DLD. Sometimes we are, so you know, we, in we, the, we can, yeah. They can look at us and we. Yeah, <laughs> we don't hear any, but we can talk more. What is your favorite car of, out of BMW? I have a very clear answer to it. That's the car you've seen in Dingolfing. Yeah, the, yeah, IX. That's the IX, which yeah. is coming, which has yeah. in, in three months' time, we have a start of production, and then shortly after, it will be in the market. It's an absolutely fascinating car. I drove it over the weekend again, because mm -hmm. not only because I wanted to test it, but uh, because I just love that car. And who is the cons future consumer of it? I think it's a, it's a typical, someone, someone we might call first movers, but at the same time, it's right in the middle of the fastest growing market segment. It's the mid-sized mid um, sports, sports activity vehicle, so almost everybody can drive it. All you need is a charging station. 
Mm -hmm. That's a prerequisite, yeah. and then then everyone can drive it. And we just learned there's not enough yet, but not, it will not be enough challenged. yet. Yeah, yeah, but that, yeah. that will be a challenge. Yeah. But we are, yeah. of course, uh, pushing that as well. Good, good, yeah. good. Okay, so thank you so much. I think we go. We are ready for now. Not, we are never ready. We will be always continuing. Continue. Always, always continuing. Continue. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steffi. Um, Ciao, thank you so much. Ciao.